Hello everyone, welcome back. Today I have an exciting blog post to go through with you all. Uh, this one is about the rapture, the tribulation timeline, and the abomination of desolation. Uh, I'm going to just uh, start right here with the main infographic that this entire blog post is going to go over. And it shows us the timeline for the next seven years according to my best understanding of Scripture. Um, now, I could be wrong. Uh, I'm just a guy who's reading the Scriptures, praying, trying to understand. But uh, I think you'll find that this timeline is highly supported by Scripture, and I'm very excited to get into it. So, uh, let's get started. This post, I will document the scriptural evidence to support the tribulation timeline in the image above. I'll go into extensive detail about the nature and timing of the abomination of desolation, including an in-depth analysis of Daniel's prophecy, which provides the exact timing of the infamous abomination. By exact timing, I mean it tells us he told us precisely the year in which it would occur, not relative to some mysterious covenant with the Antichrist. But he told us the year in advance, and I'll get to that in a bit. To understand everything I'm about to share would be helpful, but not necessary, to watch my prior videos, which provide the evidence for the following claims I build upon. Over the past several videos, I have provided a new understanding of Daniel 9 uh, and Jeremiah 25, which clearly establish that the day of the Lord, of uh, day of Jehovah, is on the 70th Jubilee, starting from the Jordan crossing in 1406 BC. Furthermore, I show that the covenant with the multitude was seven times one and a half weeks of years, or 73.5 years, starting with the birth of John the Baptist and ending with the fall of the Second Temple in 70 AD, at which point he, Jehovah, stopped the daily sacrifices, put an end to them. Finally, I document the uh, extensive, almost indisputable evidence that Yeshua gave his life for our sins in 31 AD. Um, so if you haven't seen all that content, I, uh, I highly recommend it. Um, I'm going to be assuming that you'll just take my word that it's 31 AD and 1406 uh, and that uh, I've got some of these other things right. But please check out those videos if you have any doubts. All right. So as a consequence of these new revelations is that much traditional end times analysis must be reconsidered and revisited in light of the new understanding. So this post will provide the scriptural evidence for a tribulation timeline beginning in the fall of 2024. But first, we must gain wisdom and understanding about the nature and timing of the abomination of desolation. <clears throat> so, when is the abomination of desolation? I'm going to start by going through Daniel 12 uh, and providing whatever insights uh, Jehovah has revealed to me. Um, I pray that they are accurate and complete. So at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children, the sons, or the army of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since the yeah, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered. So he's telling us this is when the rapture is going to occur. Everyone that shall be found in the book. So, let's uh, get right to it. Uh, several things stand out to me in this verse. It calls Michael the great prince, uh, which could link the new understanding of the two countdowns of the 490 years to Messiah Prince. The first countdown was to Messiah. The second countdown could be to the prince, which is Michael who stands up at the beginning of the tribulation, uh, just like uh, we saw in the Jordan crossing. Check this vision out. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. He had a vision. 
And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword. I established in my previous post that a sword in end times is nuclear missiles. It was drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain, this is the same word there, prince of the host, which is the army of Jehovah, Am I now come? Joshua 5, 13 through 14. This occurred just before the Battle of Jericho, right after Passover, that Joshua had this vision. Um, so if, if you compare the taking of the Promised Land, that six years of war, it occurred at the beginning of that war. Uh, so this is my evidence that um, Daniel 12, uh, Michael shall stand up, there's a man standing there with a sword, the great prince for the people. Uh, so he's going to, it's the same parallel. All right. Um, and there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Is it possible that the Red Rider is Michael? I think it could be. Um, so, yeah, please check out my past video on um, nuclear war and the tribulation in Zechariah 5 to understand the great sword. Um, I think there's also the, the Garden of Edom video goes into that a little bit more too if you check out my YouTube channel. All right, now let's look at Daniel 12, 2 through 3. And many, or a multitude of them that sleep in the dust of the earth, shall wake, wake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Uh, this is clearly an indication that we are rewarded for turning people to righteousness, for turning people away from sin, and encouraging people to repent. Um, and this happens right after Michael is standing there uh, at the beginning of the tribulation, uh, if I'm interpreting this correctly. Um, <clears throat> so, um, you know, while Joshua appeared right after Passover, I believe this is going to happen in the fall. Um, because of uh, the Jubilee year and the um, year of release. But we'll get more into that later. All right, then Daniel says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Uh, since we know we are at the time of the end, it is clear that this book is being unsealed, and the knowledge is increasing by running back and forth through the scriptures. Um, you know, I, I can't deny that my knowledge has been increasing in the book of Daniel, even though I've read it for years. All right. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood two, uh, so the other two, one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be? to the end of these wonders. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, that it shall be for time, times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter, I believe that the better translation here would be to distribute the power or the hand to the holy people at the millennial, millennial reign, He's going to put his holy people in charge of governing the world. Uh, all these things shall be finished. All right. The wording for time is moed, or appointed time. So the words for times means two or more appointed times. It doesn't necessarily just mean two. It could mean any number. It's just plural. Um, I have not yet figured out what half an appointed time means. I actually think I have figured it out at the end, but when I wrote this, I, I didn't. 
So this understanding will have to wait for a future time, the end of this post. Uh, the common understanding is that three and a half years, but if that purpose was to communicate three and a half years, he would have likely used uh, days or half a week or any number of ways to communicate that. So I think this is actually talking about appointed times in, in some sense. All right. And I heard, but I understood not. Then I said, I, oh my Lord, uh, what? I think that's better translated as how long until or when shall be the end of these things? And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and be made white and tried, but the wicked also shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Here is a promise. Uh, those that seek him and are wise will understand. Uh, if you ask for wisdom, he is faithful and just to give it to you if you seek it with all your heart, mind, soul. So... Um, I believe that's where a lot of the wisdom uh, is coming from, is that, that he is revealing it now. They are sealed up until he reveals it. All right. So, even though they just told Daniel, uh, you know, go thy way, they do answer his question in the very next verse. So, this is the 1,290 and 1,335 days. And from that time, the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. In a minute, I'll show you how, why I think this is was taken away. And the abomination, which I believe is fire, that makes death desolate, set up. There shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waits, doesn't stop counting, and comes or touches or strikes or counts to the thousand three hundred. In 35 days. Daniel 12, 11. This verse is typically interpreted as there will be 1,290 1, literal 24-hour days between the taking of the daily sacrifice away and the coming of Messiah. Now, this is based upon the teaching that the Antichrist will confirm a covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he will cause the daily sacrifice to cease. The second count is therefore presumed to also have the same starting point because otherwise it would go clear past the end of the presumed seven-year tribulation. I will debunk this reckoning shortly, but first, let's deal with the counts. I read it as a count of 1,290 prophetic days as years. But don't stop. Keep counting. Blessed is he who counts another 1,335 years for a total of 2,625 years. So is there any significance to stopping partway? Maybe. I haven't figured it out just yet. Um, some people speculate Dome of the Rock, but I don't know. Maybe. But let's ignore that for now and go back to debunking the Antichrist stopping the sacrifices in the midst of the tribulation. If you'd see my other videos, I, I went over this in more detail, but I'll go real quickly just for those who have the context here. And he shall confirm the covenant with many, or with the multitude, for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. That's the traditional understanding of Daniel 9.27. This is what the Hebrew says. Um, I got the translation right down here. It reads, He, or Yeshua, shall strengthen the covenant with the many, the multitude, for a week of one and a half weeks, which is 73.5 years. And then he, Yehovah, shall stop the sacrifice and oblation because of the overspreading abominations. He shall make it desolate. So a week of one and a half weeks is 73.5 years. It is widely accepted that the second temple was destroyed on the 9th of Av, on the 5th month of 70 AD. This length of time is exactly how long it is from the birth of John the Baptist to the destruction of the second temple, which caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease. 
See my video, Making the Case for 31 AD Crucifixion, for more details on this relationship. Also, check out my video, Daniel 9 Unsealed, for how I break down this translation. So with this interpretation of Daniel 9.27, there is no Antichrist covenant for one week during which the sacrifices will be cut off in the midst. Uh, this verse has already been fulfilled. Therefore, we must find a different anchor point for the 1,290 or 1,335 days. Um, and that's how we know it can't be literal days. Um, I mean, unless there's some other point, we don't know when this is going to be. Um, you know, I guess maybe the temple could be reconstructed. Maybe sacrifices could be started again. But we're not guaranteed that, and uh, we know we don't have any reference to them, it being stopped again in the future. All right, so here's how I would tweak the translation. From the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, should be changed to the time that it was taken away. I think it's past tense from Daniel's time. And going to, in the future, the setting up of the abomination of desolate will be 2,625 years. So that's what I think it's gonna, it actually says, and I'll go into the evidence for that here in just a second. All right, so according to the documentation at Blue Letter Bible, the Hebrew word translated as shall be taking away is in the perfect uh, quatol, uh type, which according to Blue, Blue Letter Bible, is most often treated as in the past because it is easier to think of past event as complete or perfect than it is to think of a future one. So the interpreters chose an uncommon use of this to imply future. This is going to happen in the future. But the you know, there's no evidence to suggest that that's the case when the normal, the most common treatment of this word would just say, this taking away of the sacrifice is something that had already happened at the time of Daniel. All right, so can we find a past perfect complete event from Daniel's time period that could serve as the starting point for the 1,290 days? I think the sacking of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar is a good option. So let's read about it. In the eighth year of the reign of the king of Babylon, he took Jehoiakim prisoner. As the Lord had declared, Nebuchadnezzar removed the treasures from the temple of the Lord and from the royal palace and cut up the gold articles that Solomon the king of Israel had made for the temple of Jehovah. Then the captain of the guards took the chief priest uh, and the second priest with three officers of the temple. So, this is a literal taking away of the sacrifices. You didn't, you know, unlike uh, the Daniel 9, 27, where he caused it to cease or stop, here he took the high priest and all the articles of the temple and he took them away to Babylon. I think that's a more accurate description of this event uh, than the second temple destruction, for example. Uh, so this verse tells us exactly when the daily sacrifices were taken away because all the gold articles were taken. Right? And it tells us that it was in the eighth year of the reign of the king of Babylon. The eighth year is actually when he took Jehoiakim prisoner. We'll see in a second that uh, uh, the, it was plundered at the end of the seventh year. So right around Passover time is when all this went down. All right, this verse tells us uh, when it was all taken away. So let's talk about the future setup of the abomination of desolation. Before getting to the exact year the daily was taken away, our starting point, let's look at the second verb of the sentence, to set up. This verb is in the infinitive construct, which means to go, or going, or ongoing, or in the future. So we have from the past, something complete, to something that's incomplete in the future, 
Uh, and that tells us that the numbers are the time between these two events. Uh, most people I've ever seen is, sees the abomination of desolation and the stopping of sacrifices as being one thing that occurred at the same time. But the verb tenses indicate that one happened in the past from Daniel's perspective, and one's going to happen in the future at the, end of, at the end of time. As we can see, uh, yeah, it's non-complete state taking away the sacrifice and, desol and, the, and the desolation are two separate events happening at different points in time. All right. Yeah. So when was the daily sacrifice literally taken away to Babylon? The Babylonian lun lunar calendar is very similar to the modern Jewish calendar. That should be a big warning flag that something could be amiss with the current Jewish calendar. Um, starting in the spring. So we have astronomical records that help us fix the dates precisely. Uh, that 4956, uh, which is reference to a, a clay tablet that was found, contains over 21 observations of the sun, moon, stars, and planets that unequivocally identify Nebuchadnezzar's 37th year. Other tablets identify other years. They all agree. We know precisely when the, the years of Nebuchadnezzar's reign map to years BC. All right. So from this, we can know with near certainty that the first year of Nebuchadnezzar was 604 BC, and his eighth year began in 597 BC. Now, there are secular records that indicate that Jerusalem actually fell at the end of his seventh year, which would have him taken into captivity in the eighth year, just like the Bible says. So imagine you, know, you fall at the end of December, you take the prisoners, and you take them away to Babylon in January. Right? It's, it's, it's uh, right there on the border between those two years. So we put all this information together, and what do we get? We get from 598 B.C., the seventh year of Nebuchadnezzar, at the end, just before the eighth year when he goes into captivity, uh, you have 1,290 plus uh, 1,335 inclusive years. And you get to the abomination of desolation. So that's what I think the text says. Let's uh, continue. Um... So, yeah, it should occur by the spring of 2028. And everyone found written in the book of life will be delivered, raptured before that time. Not at that time, but before that time. The abomination of desolation. This phrase is used in several places throughout the Bible. And at first glance, many people assume that it is a single thing. Because the use of the definite article the rather than an indefinite an abomination of desolation while I agree that it is a definite type of thing, it isn't a specific event. And I'm going to uh, show that here in a second. So let's look at Matthew 24, 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. That's an indication that you need future context in order to understand what he is saying. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. This verse clearly connects the abomination in the future tribulation to something that Daniel spoke of. Clearly, Matthew was addressing a future audience because why would he include the phrase, let the reader understand, if the future context wasn't required? That said, let's review the three potential references from Daniel to see what abomination Matthew was referring to. His first reference. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. They will set up the abomination that causes desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant by eating pigs. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. But the people who know their God will firmly resist him. So, around the six, eight, one, eight, sorry, 168 BC, the Greek king... Uh, Antiochus invaded Jerusalem, captured the city, 
He marched into the Jewish temple, erected a statue of the Greek god Zeus, and sacrificed a pig on the altar of incense. This is the abomination of desolation that I believe Daniel 11.31, and most scholars agree Daniel 11.31 is referring to. An abomination of fire, which destroys completely, making desolate. Altar of incense is burned completely. So the Maccabean War lasted seven years, the end of which was a creation of Hanukkah. Uh, I would say that is from uh, some firm resistance when people would rather die than eat pig. So be warned that according to Isaiah chapter 66, discussing the future coming judgment by fire, eating pig will still be an issue in spite of modern interpretations of Peter and Paul. Uh, it might be worthwhile to uh, ask yourself if the Bible is inconsistent. Uh, it's probably not the Bible. It's probably our understanding. All right. Yeah, because this is why Isaiah 66 says, They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens, uh, behind one tree uh, in the midst, so in the middle of the gardens, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse, and shall be, uh, they shall be consumed together, saith Jehovah. The King James Version of this doesn't read as smoothly as some other translations, but the idea is swine's flesh is an abomination at that time. All right. So now would be a very good time to repent, uh, and I'd say it's better safe than sorry, right? If there's 50-50 chance that we understand Peter wrong, uh, then yeah, I'm not going to take my chances with it. All right. Scholars agree that this chapter of Daniel was fulfilled in history. I haven't done the research in depth to see how complete the fulfillment was, but there's always a possibility of a double fulfillment. That said, I am currently uh, um, going to side with the consensus opinion on this one. So let's compare that to the abomination described in the New Testament. Here it says, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. That's the exact opposite. Now, the first one in Daniel says they will stand firm and resist. This future one, people need to flee and run. That sounds like two different abominations. So that can't be the same abomination that um, the Daniel's referencing. Sorry, Matthew is not referencing uh, Daniel 11.31. Now, this is a different abomination. Uh, and that by itself is enough to prove that the abomination of desolation isn't a single thing uh, or a single event. Um, so let's look at Daniel's second reference. This is from Daniel 9.27. Wait a second, that verse keeps coming up. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. And in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to the sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Now, wait, I use the NIV translation here just to show how bad the NIV translation is. Because they translated abomination that causes desolation here in this verse because it's such a popular concept. Everyone is looking for it. And Matthew referenced it. And so I thought, I think they were trying to do the reader a favor by linking this to it. But let's look at what the King James says. Um, you know, I've already covered in my previous videos that this verse is talking about the 73 and a half years from John the Baptist to the 7 AD destruction. The phrase, an abomination that causes desolation, isn't even used in the King James Version. It says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And because of the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. It's not the abomination that's making things desolate. He's making it desolate because of the abomination. Uh, so even until the consummation, and, uh, and that shall be determined, poured out on the desolate. All right, so once again, see my prior post where I dive into it. Needless to say, we know this isn't the abomination of desolation. This is a prophecy predicting the 70 AD destruction of the temple. 
also something that has already happened. So therefore, this cannot be the verse that Daniel, sorry, that Matthew was referencing from Daniel. Uh, and you know, it's also clear that the he here can't be the Antichrist because when is the Antichrist ever concerned with abominations? He is an abomination. He, uh, the satanic credo is uh, do what thou wilt. Nothing is an abomination from his perspective. Um, so this just makes no sense for this to be what the Antichrist is doing. All right. Uh, so and just beware of translations that just invoke this phrase because it can cause confusion and be a mistranslation of the text. Uh, and, you know, of course, they have hidden the true actor of the passage, Jehovah. All that said, there will be a future abomination that makes desolate, standing or set up in the holy place at the midpoint of the tribulation. And I think uh, it will indeed be caused by the Antichrist in order to kill the two witnesses. However, it will not be the Antichrist nor an idol. So this conclusion was drawn not from Daniel 9.27, but as a result of rightly interpreting the very next reference. Daniel's third reference, and this is the last one and the only one, so this must be the one that Matthew was referring to. <clears throat> and from the time the daily sacrifice was taken away, and to the setting up of the abomination, the fire that makes desolate, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days, but less it is he who waits and doesn't stop counting, and comes, touches two strikes, or counts to the thousand three hundred and thirty fifth day. So keep counting, that will tell you exactly when the abomination of desolation will arrive, 28, sorry, 2028. And more specifically, Passover time, 2028. All right, so let's define abomination, desolation, and the setting up. I'm going to read from Leviticus 10.1. And the sons of Aaron took uh, either of them his censer, and put fire therein. The word put fire is set up. Uh, it's the exact same word in Hebrew. And they put incense thereon and offered strange and abomination, fire, and fire is what causes desolation, before Jehovah, which he commanded them not. And they lost their lives for this strange abominable fire. So this sounds exactly like what happened when pigs were sacrificed on the altar of incense, as, Dan, as in Daniel 11. So the point of the verse is here to show that the phrase put fire is the same word as to set up fire or to start a fire. Um, and you know, I've got the Strong's definition here. Um, and you can see uh, they shall place Natan and to put Natan. So put fire therein, they shall place, it can be set up to put, to be made. So it could be make fire, um, would be another interpretation of this, uh, this verse. All right, so now I'm going to review Zechariah 5 and his description of nuclear ICBM. If you haven't seen my video blog on this topic, it is a must-see to understand that the fall of Babylon the great and the rapture occur at the same time, and that is by a surprise nuclear destruction that destroys Babylon in a single hour. So please check out this video. I apologize for the poor form factor. It was my first video uh, since I started doing this. All right. I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of or as a thief. And it shall remain in the midst of the house, and it shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. So this it is the fire. This is the curse this, that goes out in Zechariah 5. And behold, there was lifted up a talent, 75 pounds 
of lead. Uh, uranium decays to lead. It says, and this is a fire offering to be consumed, to be fully consumed, that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. The ephah is the payload. This is a six-gallon payload on the, on the nuke. Then what did the angel say? The angel said, this is wickedness. And he threw it back down in the middle of the ephah, the payload, and he put a lead cover on its opening. Right? The uranium goes inside the, the nuke. It's encased in lead to protect people and to shield it from detectors. Uh, so I got to think about, wait, what does wickedness define as? Let the Bible define itself. And so I searched, and I was amazed at what I found. This is great new insight that I wish I had had in the original video. Uh, Surely wickedness burns like a fire. It consumes briars and thorns. Uh, It sets the forest thickets ablaze so that it rolls upward in a column of smoke. Whoa. When I read that, I I got the you know, shivers, because this is full of so much symbology and meaning and connects to so many other things. You know, particularly, what, it, what does it consume? Briars and thorns. The Bible tells us what that's defined as. Uh, and then we have rolls upward as a column of smoke. That's, where have I heard that before? Let's think about that. Keep that in mind for what's coming. But first, I want to provide the context of Isaiah 9.18. Because this context is going to be an example that uh, will blow your mind. If you've ever seen any of Jonathan Kahn's videos, he mentions some of this. All right, so while we're here in Isaiah, let me point out a broader context. The context of Isaiah 9.18 is the judgment in the day of Jehovah. Take note of the warning given just prior to the judgment in verses 9 through 11. 9.11. And the people shall know, even Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, that say in pride and stoutness of heart, the bricks are falling down, but we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. Therefore, Jehovah shall set up the adversaries of Rezin against, against him and join his enemies together. Isaiah 9.11 now, this seems kind of cryptic at first, but once you understand what it's saying, it's going to be mind-blowing to you. Now, verse 10 of this was quoted by Tom Daschle to Congress and the world on 9-12-2021, the day after 9-11. Uh, and you can also watch uh, John Edwards also quotes this on the anniversary of 9-11, in 2004 at a talk. All right, in this day of remembrance and mourning, we have the Lord's word to get us through. The bricks have fallen, but we will build with dress stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will put cedars in their place. We've got two witnesses in the U.S. Congress declaring this verse uh, in pride uh, inside the United States. So instead of taking the judgment and repenting, we had pride. So what does the verse tell us is the consequences of this pride? Therefore, Jehovah shall d- set up the adversaries of resident against him. Like, well, who are the adversaries? And the adversaries uh, was Syria and the Philistines, which is Gaza, and the allies, Russia and Iran. Well, what's happened since 9-11? We have the 10 BRICS nations form allies, and they are against us. So, who was attacked? We were. I think this serves to confirm my suspicion that we are Babylon the Great. We are the one that's going to be brought down. And we're going to be brought down by wickedness that burns like a fire, rolls up in a column of smoke. And I think we are the briars and the thorns. I'll get this at in a second. So, back to the abomination. Where else have we seen the phrase rolled up? It's right here. 
And the host of heaven, the sun, moon, and stars, shall be dissolved, faded, or clouded. And the heavens, or the sky, shall be rolled together like a scroll. And their host, everything that's in the sky, planes, bombs, missiles, will fall down uh, as the leaf falls from the vine, and as the falling fig from the fig tree. Isaiah 34, 4. Uh, all this terminology here helps link things to Revelation as well. In Revelation 6, 14. And the sky departed as a scroll when it was rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. This is shaking caused by nukes. Here's a nuke. Here's the sky, the air rolling up like a scroll. And then immediately after that, the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every freeman hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. Everyone goes to the fallout shelters. And now we come full circle. Let's look at Matthew 24, 15 again. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand there's that future context. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, hid in rocks of the mountains. That's a direct connection that shows the abomination that causes desolation is probably a nuke. All right, so let's look at this. Uh, um, let the reader understand the future context here. So, with the con understanding that Zechariah 5's flying 35 foot roll with a six foot diameter that carries a six gallon payload with 75 pounds of wickedness or lead uranium, it carries it between the heaven and earth to deliver a curse or a fire that consumes everything, including the stone. And where does it deliver it to? Babylon the Great. So here you go. That's the future context. So now let's look at briars and thorns. And this verse came to mind. The other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns, they are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Well, Babylon the Great is known about for her riches and worldly and her wealth. Babylon the Great is the thorns. We need to come out of her um, because that is who is going to be destroyed. It's by the wickedness that burns like a fire. It's going to look like a forest fire that rolls up and calms the smoke. The th thorns are the ones that are going to be burning. Right? So... Yeah, there we go. So, I found this picture here, um, which is a forest fire that shows a mushroom cloud. Natural mushroom cloud from a forest fire, as described. Not only that, it's blocking out a third of the sun. So, that context there gives a great visual for this verse uh, in Isaiah that defines wickedness. And wickedness is what the ICBM is delivering. I don't know how the scripture could be any more clear given the time that it was written and the message it has to communicate to us today uh, once we have this context. All right. So there's one other uh, verse that we need to get some understanding of before we get to the timeline. In Matthew 24, immediately after telling everyone to flee from the abomination and with haste, right? They're not supposed to go down. They got to run quickly. Fall out waits for no man. Uh, Yeshua warns us, uh, for who, wheresoever the corpse is, there the eagles will be gathered together. That verse is cryptic, but let's try to unpack it. Um, I'd like to comment on this because a lot of translations translate it as vultures. And why does that make sense? Well, a corpse and vulture goes together. A corpse and eagles don't normally go together. Uh, but the text clearly says eagles. So the word eagle has been used to refer to angels in several different contexts of ancient texts. 
uh, and several different uh, old records that we have swap the word angel and eagle, right? So the King James Version says, And I beheld and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Whoa, whoa, whoa. But NIV, NLT, or ESV says, As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying midair call out in a voice. So it's clear in ancient times, the words were interchangeable and the scribes just swapped one for the other to be more clear. Um, But because the eagle worded is from older text, um, that's what these translations use. Um, But there's other verses in scripture that confirm that eagles and angels are tied together. Yea, have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Eagles' wings, angels carrying his people out. And the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness, where she would be taken care of for time, times, and half a time, out of the serpent's reach. Well, there you go. Both in Exodus and in the future Revelation, angels and eagles are tied together. All right. Now, as I promised, let's get to the timeline. So... I made this timeline first, and then as I was reviewing Matthew 24, I noticed a connection between the verse numbers in Matthew 24 and the years on the timeline. Uh, I just want to point out that I did not allow the verse numbers to direct the timing of things, but they are a confirmation of it. So here is the timeline, and I'm going to go through each year and provide the scriptures that document those years. So, Matthew 24, verse 23, is all about false predictions. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. In the past year, we've talked about, you know, this Jewish Messiah that people have been looking at, looking for. But I also think this refers to all the watchmen, including myself, who have been saying, look, here's a rapture date, or here's a rapture date, or he's going to be here on this day. Do not believe it. That's what this verse is telling us. We now know that, yeah, we shouldn't have believed any of the predictions that we have heard in the past year. Um, So, uh, I think it still applies for people that are predicting, he's going to be here this week. Uh, I don't think he can show up until this fall. Uh, We'll get to that in a bit. 2024 is the rapture and the fall of Babylon. This is... This is the event we've all been looking for um, because it's the 50th year. Right? This is the Jubilee. We declare the Jubilee at the Day of Atonement. It's the seventh year of the Shemitah cycle. That's where the debt forgiveness, uh, that's when Yeshua was reading the scrolls. And it's the fall of Babylon. It's the beginning of sorrows. Beginning of sorrows, fall of Babylon, rapture. All happens this fall on those feast days. Uh, Let me get into that. What does Matthew 24 say? For false Christ, a.k.a. the Antichrist, and false prophets and his false prophet will appear and perform great signs and wonders that would deceive even the elect if that were possible. According to this, it's going to occur this year. Interestingly, it's 24-24. There's a lot of meaning to number 24. I'm not going to get into it uh, at this time, but very fascinating. All right, so there will be famines and earthquakes and ICBMs in various places. The earthquakes are the ICBMs, the nukes. All these are the beginning of birth pains, Matthew 24, 8. This verse relates to Jeremiah 51, 46 through 47, which is a parallel to Matthew 24, 4 through 8, which I covered in my prior post. Bottom line is, we know the beginning of sorrows are tied to the fall of Babylon. All right. And because of the multiplication of wickedness, so because of the many wickedness and many bombs and nukes, the love of most will grow cold. Matthew 24, 13. All right. The start of the two witnesses. Uh, This also starts this fall. 
And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, a thousand two hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. Revelation 11, 3. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached into all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. I think this, the two witnesses, is the gospel being preached to all the nations. I do not believe that it is um, what happens, you know, people say, we've got to preach to the whole world so that he can come back. No, his timeline has been set f- from the beginning of time. He set the sun, moon, and stars for signs of the times. The Revelation 12 sign was set in place uh, at the beginning of creation. The uh, other signs in the sun, moon, and stars, like the eclipses recently, were all established well in advance. This day does not depend upon human efforts. He's sending his two witnesses. They're going to be preaching for three and a half years, and the, and the whole world will hear the, the good news at that time. It'll be their time to repent. All right. Note that on the Day of Atonement, in the 49th year, the Jubilee is... Uh, yeah, 49th year of the Jubilee uh, is when the 50th year, the Jubilee year, is consecrated. Then, at the Feast of Tabernacles, is when debts are forgiven and slaves are set free. This is the last Sabbath year until Messiah returns in 31 AD. Therefore, it is my belief that this will be the time of the rapture. Because the rapture is when we're forgiven, we're set free, it's when we're given our clean robes. Uh, my prior posts in Jeremiah fifteen fifty one clearly describe uh, the time when our sins will be found no more. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I post this as a short video that goes into detail about when the year of release and uh, the debt forgiveness is, uh, as far as just biblically in the seven year cycle. When does that occur? All right. So now. Um, let's go to the Jubilee. See, I have told you in advance, Matthew four twenty five. All right, so we're on the twenty fifth year. See, I have told you in advance. This lines up with the Jubilee, which starts uh, Passover time uh, in twenty twenty five. Okay. So, um, yeah, what has he told us in advance? Well, as I saw in my previous videos, Jeremiah 25 and Daniel 9 all say that there's going to be 70 jubilees from the time of crossing the Jordan, and then the end will come. This is what he told us in advance. Plain as day, he spelled it out. And Matthew 25 tells us the exact year that the 70th jubilee occurs. Is 2025, the spring thereof. All right, 2026. So if they tell you, there he is in the wilderness, do not go out, or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. This is going to be a time of great deception. All right? This is when the Antichrist is going to you know, be on the scene and everyone's going to go say, oh, look over here, here he is, here's our Savior. Do not believe it, 2026. All right, 2027. For just as lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. I believe that this verse relates to the 200 million army from the east of the Euphrates. This is the second woe which ends at the abomination of desolation. Let's see what it says. And saying unto the sixth angel, which sat, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, and which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay a third part of men. It just occurred to me that the four angels might be referring to the angels or the rulers of the four countries east of the Euphrates. Uh, And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, 200 million. And I heard the number of them. 
At the end of 2027, after the two witnesses are killed uh, by the abomination of desolation, I'll get to that in a bit, there is an earthquake and the start of the third woe, which comes with flashes of lightning. So uh, there came great flash of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder and an earthquake. That's at the end of 2027, start of 2028. So let's look at our timeline here. Uh, 2027, lightning from east to west. This is 200 million man army, which ends. Um, And this is the second woe. And what that means is the first woe, the locusts that come and cause people to wish they were dead, that happens probably in 2026, but it could be in 2025 as well. I expect that to be from Passover to Tabernacles on one of those two years. I'm guessing... 2025 is going to be consumed with nuclear war, and I think the locusts uh, will probably be in 2026. I think you're going to have famine, plague, and radiation, and all that other stuff going on in 2025. But yeah, I don't have scriptures to back the inner details of 2025. All right, let's look at 2028. Wherever there is a carcass, Two witnesses, dead bodies of the two witnesses, there the eagles will gather. So this is the end of the two witnesses after the 1,260 days. Their bodies will lie in the plaza of Jerusalem for three and a half days. Uh, If they were killed by radioactive nukes, then it makes perfect sense why no one would touch them. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. All right, let's go back to the timeline. So we have the two witnesses, and this is the three and a half years where they prophesy, which starts right here with the um, fall of Babylon and ends at the abomination of desolation. I think the world gets so fed up with these two witnesses that the Antichrist uh, or whoever is in power at that point in time decides to nuke them as, you know, because that's the only way that people can think of to overcome them is to nuke them. Uh, It's going to be an interesting time for those who survive. I pray that we all are raptured. All right. So now when they have finished their testimony which is the gospel preached through the whole world before it comes. The beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them. I think that's the nuke. And overpower them and kill them. It could also be part of the 200 million man army, uh, which includes China or India or all those people over there. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, Jerusalem, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. There's only one city where our Lord was crucified, Jerusalem. Um, And so it's going to be in the plaza of Jerusalem. The plaza of Jerusalem is the Temple Mount. For three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts, because these two prophets had tormented those who lived on the earth. But after three and a half years, sorry, three and a half days, the breath of life of God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. And then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here, and they went up to heaven, uh, and they went up into heaven in a cloud, while their enemies looked on. I suspect there's angels gathered here to do this, just like there were angels when Yeshua went up to heaven, and there were angels when he rose from the tomb. And you know, angels always seem to be around when God's doing things. So at that very hour, there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the Elohim of heaven. The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming soon. There you have it. Second woe is the horseman. It has passed at the abomination of desolation. So what do I have in my chart? 
We've got the Abomination of Desolation, the 200 million army. It ends, and then the third woe, which is the Great Tribulation, begins shortly thereafter. All right, let's continue. So I want to point out that the chapter on the two witnesses is chapter 1-1, which is two witnesses. And that there are 14 verses, which is 2 times 7, that describe it. It's just interesting how... <laughs> All right, so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination of desolation described by the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those in Judea flee to the mountains. I want to highlight those fleeing to the mountains in relation to the 80th year of Israel. If those days, which I believe is the fig tree generation, had not been cut short, nobody would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. And there's a lot of, been a lot of speculation on what this means. And I, I think I figured it out. Or he has revealed it. I don't want to take credit for what he has showed me. All right. I would like to point out that May 2028 marks the end of 80 years from the founding of Israel. This generation is described by Psalms 90.10, where it is cut short, and then the generation flies away on two great eagle wings, or angel wings, for time, times, and half a time. So, the days of our years are three score and ten, or seventy years, and if by reason of strength they be eighty years, yet it is their strength, uh, labor, and sorrow. So, in, in, in the strength of the years, the last ten years, is labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off or cut short, and we fly away, we flee. Psalm ninety ten is talking about the fig tree generation precisely. It gets cut short, and then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So if I go to my um, video here, my image, we've got the fig tree generation, then fly away. The wind fled to the wilderness for 1,260 days for time, times, and half. Right? And... It's interesting that we have a theme here after the abomination desolation. Uh, flee to the mountains with the wilderness with two wings, mountains and wilderness. There we go. That's where they're fleeing to. Uh, we have the eagles gathering the bodies. What's interesting is they gather the bodies for 3.5 days after 3.5 days. Well, 3.5 days is this length of time from the abomination of desolation until Tabernacles 2031. And that's when the angels gather the elect from the four corners of the world. So these eagles are doing a lot of, uh, a lot of work moving people around. Uh, I just noticed this correlation here between the eagles. It might entirely be possible that from the nuking of Israel, it's three and a half years until the bodies are raised. Or it could be a double prophecy, or, or just like a, a coincidence. Or there's no such thing as a coincidence when it comes to Scripture, as I'm finding out. Um, but yeah, I just thought that was very interesting that, you know, if those days being cut short, well, Psalms 90 tells you the 80 years of a generation are the days that are cut short, and then we fly away. And that is right here on the 80th year anniversary at the Abomination of Desolation which was perfectly prophesied from the first temple falling or when the treasuries were taken away, right? When the sacrifices were taken away. Uh, and it lines up perfectly with when the two witnesses are supposed to be dead because they show up here at the beginning of the tribulation, the census two witnesses. They witness for two and a half, sorry, for three and a half years, puts it precisely at the abomination of desolation. Uh, and we know that the abominations, which ought not to be on the Temple Mount, we know that that's the plaza, you know, the 
prophecy about the second rebuilding with plaza and moat. It's talking about the Temple Mount area. Uh, all those things tie together to this one moment in time. This is kind of like the 1955 moment from Back to the Future. Everything points here. All right. So let's get to the timing of the abomination of desolation. Um, so a couple things to point out this timeline is the abomination of desolation occurs around the spring Passover 2028. This is halfway between two Sabbath years, making it as far from a Sabbath as possible. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath. I don't think Yeshua would instruct us to pray a prayer that he didn't intend to fulfill or grant. So he's telling us that the flight will not be in winter and it will not be on the Sabbath. So uh, let's look at the chart again. We've got one Sabbath year right here in 2024. We're currently in the middle of a Sabbath year, if my calculations of the Jordan crossing are correct. And the next Sabbath year is 2030. Uh, yeah, 2030 is the next Sabbath year. Oh, sorry, 2031. Um, so you add seven years to 2024, it goes to 2031. So that uh, is the next Sabbath year. The abomination of desolation is in the middle, not on the Sabbath as far as away, and it's occurring in the spring at Passover time. So the two witnesses were just killed. So it's time for the end to come. And the gospel shall be preached to all of the world for a witness unto all nations. And then the end to come. Witness and then the end. Now, 2029 is the start of the Great Tribulation. So what does verse 29 of Matthew 24 tell us immediately after the tribulation of those days the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken Matthew 24 29 now what happens to be coming for us on this particular time is Apophis this is a demon serpent of the darkness whom Ra, as the sun god, destroys every morning at dawn. That's what this asteroid, which is the size of the Empire State Building, as far as height, but of course its mass, is, it's much bigger and wider and everything. Now, this is a massive asteroid uh, that's coming to Earth. Now, according to NASA, it's only going to get between us and our satellites. It's going to be closer to Earth than some of the man-made satellites that are orbiting. No other asteroid in known history of this magnitude has come this close to Earth. It would only take a slight solar wind or flare or impact or off-gassing. Any small little thing could easily divert this asteroid by just like 40,000 kilometers, according to their estimates, and it would hit Earth. Now, um, <clears throat> what does Revelation 8.8 8 say? It says, And the second angel sounded, and it were... And it was, um, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And a third part of all the boats and everything else in the sea died. Well, that sounds like a massive asteroid being thrown into the ocean. Um, so when exactly is this going to occur? Well... Stars fall from the sky. Sky is darkened. Apophis arrives on Passover day, using what I believe is the true calendar, in 2029. What are the odds that it would be falling on Passover of all days? I guess one in 365. But of all days and of all years, the very year that we're predicted to have a mountain or the stars falling into the sea. 2029, right? This is at the start of the Great Tribulation, the third woe. 
So I think that that lines up so perfectly, I was shocked. All right, so, so this is util utilizing what I believe to be the true calendar based upon the full moon rather than the crescent moon. Apophis will arrive between the Earth and our own man-made satellites on Passover Day in 2029. This is perfectly timed with our scripture passages and lines up with the Great Tribulation. And NASA would never tell us the truth, even if they knew the truth, because it would cause panic. There have been movies that have talked about this, and they kept it secret right up until people could see it with their own telescopes. Uh, you know, that's just how they operate. They have these massive black budgets. They will prepare themselves. They will build bunkers for themselves. They will not tell you because they need the people to be productive, producing the, running the economy, and not competing with the elite for the resources necessary to try to survive this thing. So don't expect NASA to warn you if their calculations need updating. In fact, expect NASA to fudge on the calculations uh, to just nudge it a little bit out of the way and with such a small amount that normal people's, it's within the margin of error and people will give NASA the benefit of the doubt. You cannot trust them, trust the Bible. The Bible says that a great mountain will be thrown into the sea. All right, so um, where, where is it calculated to hit? Well, based on the time that it's supposed to arrive, it would land in the Pacific Ocean, probably off the coast of California. All right, um, so, you know, the odds, what are the odds, all right? Well, you can always ask uh, C-3PO to tell you the odds, but, you know, Han never wants to know the odds. You know, successfully navigating a meteor shower, what are the odds? All right, so, um, for more information on why I think Passover occurs on the dark moon, uh, and I believe this, you know, April 8th eclipse that we just experienced was the true Passover, I have a video here that provides all the evidence to support that claim. Um, and I encourage you to watch it all the way to the end. I saved the best for last. I will probably produce another video in the future that gives the best evidence up front and then goes from best evidence to least. But um, I do think there's a very strong case for this being true. And then 2030 is the sign of the Son of Man shall appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's happening in 2030. And then 2031 is the start of the millennial reign and the wedding. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together the elect from the four winds of the earth, everyone who survived, uh, and from one end of heaven to the other. This is at Passover. The Passover of this year, 2031, marks exactly 2,000 years from the cross. He'll be back in two days. See my video here on the practically indisputable case for 31 AD. All right. <coughs> so when is the rapture? Kind of already hinted on the timeline, but let's try to prove it with a little bit more um, precision. Let's give a day, an hour, or maybe not an hour, but a day. So, the following is my best guess, giving my current understanding of scripture and timelines involved. He's not told me. I am just trying to understand what scripture teaches so we know when to look up. So, as I document above, I believe the true calendar starts the month on the full moon. Therefore, April 8th eclipse fell on the true Passover. Major warning sign there. And then this fall, on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, on October 2nd, there is another eclipse. Uh, and this is the earliest that I would expect the year of release to be pr proclaimed according to Deuteronomy. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release, and this is the manner of the release. Every creditor shall release that which he has lent to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor, his brother, or his neighbor who is his brother. For the Lord's release is proclaimed. So this is when he proclaimed it. Beware, at least there'll be a base thought in your minds and hearts, and you say, the seventh year, the year of release is at hand. And your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you give him nothing. And he cry unto Jehovah against you, and it be sin to you. 
And if your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you as a slave and serves you for six years, think about this, mankind has been sold into slavery of sin for 6,000 years. Then in the seventh year, you shall let him go free from you. Okay? So we know it's supposed to be in the seventh year. Now, look at this. Then Moses commanded them, at the end of every seven years, in the year of canceling debts, during the Feast of Tabernacles, then when all of Israel comes to be, appear before Jehovah your Elohim, hey, wait, what's the rapture doing? We're all appearing before him. That's convenient. Uh, at the place he chooses, he's choosing the place. I guess rapture, he's calling us to him. You shall read his law before them in their hearing. Uh, I think that's when he writes his law in our hearts. All right. So, because Tabernacles is a seven-day feast with a last great day making up to eight days, this gives us a range from October 2nd to October 9th. However, we are also exactly seven years from the Revelation 12 sign, uh, which also took place right in the middle of the Feast of the Tabernacles. So I went back to Revelation 12 sign. Everyone says it occurred on uh, Feast of Trumpets that year. But, uh, or, yeah, about that time frame. But I looked it up, and it falls three days into the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles. So if we assume the rapture occurs on the exact seven-year anniversary uh, of the Revelation 12 sign, not the solar year anniversary, but the feast day year anniversary, the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles. That is when I think is the highest watch time. And this is why I think so. So if we assume Moed, Moeds, and half a Moed, or time, times, and half a time, refers to feast days, then the half Moed would be half of a feast day, which would then land perfectly on the anniversary of the Revelation 12 sign, on what I believe may be the true calendar. So that would put the rapture date of October 4th and 5th, just three days after the final eclipse this fall. Now, we won't be able to see the eclipse this fall because it's going to be in the Pacific Ocean. Maybe Hawaii will see part of it. But yeah, we won't, we won't see it, but there is an eclipse occurring. So, uh, at that time... Uh, I believe the following verse will be fulfilled just like Yeshua declared in Luke 4, 18. Except this time, the entire chapter will be completed. So let's read Isaiah 61. The Spirit of Jehovah is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. We are bound to slavery. To proclaim slavery to sin. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's where Yeshua stopped reading in his first coming because he was only declaring the release of that Shemitah year. In this future, he's also proclaiming the day of vengeance of our Elohim to comfort all that mourn, all those who are raptured are those who are mourned. That is those who are going to be comforted. I'm going to get more to that in a second. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, right, after he raptures us, he takes us to Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness. These are the two olive trees. Planted, uh, the planting of Jehovah, that he might be glorified. For your shame shall have, for your shame you shall have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land they shall possess double. Everlasting joy be unto them. For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for, for burnt offering. It's uh, interesting that Zechariah 5 talks about the curse going to those who are robbers or thieves. Uh, and it's also talking about fire and burnt offerings. Very interesting. Um, 
and I will direct their work in truth. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. So this is when he actually makes the covenant with us at that time. This is when we are actually born again. We get our new bodies. I will rejoice in Jehovah. My soul shall be joyful in my Elohim, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation, our white robes. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. He prepares us for the wedding. For as the earth brings forth her bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, this is the rapture, uh, the Lord Elohim will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations, all the, all the people, all the tribes. All right, let's look at what Jeremiah says. Uh, about the fall of Babylon the Great, right in the midst of all the nukes that are being dropped on it. You know, it falls in a single hour, right? And the rapture comes like a thief in the night, peace and safety, and then sudden destruction. Uh, so all those things are very short window of time, very suddenly and by surprise. In those days, in that time, Jehovah says, the children of Israel shall come, And the children of Judah together, both the northern and southern tribes, spread across all the nations. They are going weeping. These are those who mourn. We talk about comforting those who mourn. They're going weeping. They shall go and seek Jehovah their Elohim. They shall ask the way to Zion. How do we go to Zion, the holy place? With their faces toward Zion, saying, Come. Let us join ourselves to Jehovah in a perpetual covenant. That's just what Isaiah was talking about. This is going to have a covenant. I will make them an everlasting covenant with them. And all those who are weeping, going to Zion. My people have been a lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. Be very wary of the vast majority of pastors and teaching in church. They are lawless. Um, and they teach prosperity gospel, and they teach, uh, they undermine the very word of Elohim. They mix evolution uh, and other teachings of man in with his word. Be very, very careful. All right, so they have turned them away on mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place, their home, or their Sabbath. Interesting, they have forgotten their Sabbath. Just came to me. All right. And then it says, remove or come out or rapture out of the midst of Babylon and go forth out of the land of the Chaldeans, which is the Babylonians, the rulers of the Babylons, and be as he goats, rams, leaders, first fruits before the flocks. Jeremiah 54. All right. So there you go. Uh, In that time, during the fall of Babylon the Great, that's when people are taken to Zion. And that's when those who are weeping and mourning, those are the people, right? So what was Daniel 20 doing when he was praying? He was weeping and mourning and praying for forgiveness for his people. And then the angel came with him with the 77's prophecy. Uh, We should be weeping and mourning for our country and our people and the world because it's destruction by fire and judgment day is at hand. So if if we're getting in tune with his spirit, then we will be thinking his thoughts. And if we're thinking his thoughts, we will be feeling his feelings and we will be weeping and mourning as I'm sure he is weeping and mourning like a parent who has to punish their children. It it hurts the parent more than the kid, but the kid needs it. So that is uh, probably how he feels. It's like time to discipline. His children, he cannot tolerate the rebellion any longer. All right, then Jeremiah 50, 18. In those days, in that time, says Jehovah, the iniquity of Israel will be sought for, and there shall be none. The sins of Judah will will be searched for, and they shall not be found. For I will pardon them who I reserve. I will spare the remnant. Jeremiah 50, 18. Right in the middle of the fall of Babylon, our sins are pardoned. When their sins or debts forgiven, they are forgiven on the seventh year in the middle of the Feast of 
Tabernacles. All right, now let's, let's show how judgment and mourning are connected through the scriptures. Babylon will suddenly fall due to judgment and be broken. We are instructed to wail and mourn over her. So who's, who's weeping and mourning? Those who are following the instructions of the Bible. All right, in Jeremiah 50, 46. At the noise of the taking of Babylon, the earth is moved. You know, there's earthquakes and shakings in various appointed places. And the cry, the mourning, is heard among the nations. There shall be earthquakes, shakings, explosions, nukes in various places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. Well, there's the theme of mourning. Shaking, quakes, sorrows, all tied together. Judgment, salvation. All right, conclusion. Our Elohim is perfect in all of his details. He tells us the end from the beginning. He reveals information to those who he chooses. He does nothing without revealing his plans to his servants in advance. And he is not willing that any should perish. Even in the midst of his judgment, his hand is outstretched to those who will repent and turn from their evil and their rebellion. As I have shared this message with the number one response I get is a desire to buy beans, bullets, bullions, and a bunker to prepare for nuclear war. People will say, nuclear war is coming. I want to be prepared. That's people's attitude. Uh, but this is, this is what scripture says. He that flees from the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that gets up out of the pit shall be taken in the snare. For I will bring, it, bring upon it, even upon Moab, the year of their visitation. This is, this is the day of the Lord. This is Jeremiah. Uh, this is the fall of Babylon. Saith Jehovah. So, if you try to escape or prep your way out of this, you're not putting your faith in him to save you. And, and even if you manage to escape the initial nukes, you're going to fall into a pit. And if you manage to escape the pit, the snare would get you. You know, you can run, but you can't hide. Uh... Well, in this case, you can't even run because he knows everywhere you go. So if, if judgment is coming from you, it's going to find you. Uh, so you better repent and turn and be saved rather than attempt to rely on your own strength and your own pride and determined to survive whatever judgment he's throwing at mankind. Uh, I think it just takes a little bit of humility to realize no one can stand up against his judgments. So, as watchmen, we have responsibility to share what he reveals to us so that everyone has an opportunity to repent. If our heart is as full of love and mercy as his is, if we are, if we are like him, then we should desire to save as many people from the coming fire as possible. Now, now is the time to be bold because judgment day is coming. Everything we are tempted to put before Jehovah will be consumed in the coming fire. Your retirement plans uh, whatever it is you think you're building for your future is going to be burned up and destroyed if you believe what the Bible is saying, uh, or at least what you know the interpretation uh, that we have, the best interpretation we have. It's possible we could be wrong, but the point is store up heavenly treasures because our earthly treasures are about to be destroyed in the fire, and we can't take them with us. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? All right, so let's close with an overview of the timeline so we can take it all in. From 2023, we start with all the false predictions of rapture dates. 2024, this fall, that's when the people are... Uh, Taken away, right? The falling away is the taking away, right? To remove those who stand is the apostasy. Uh, that has to come first so that the man of sin can be revealed. So that's going to happen 2024, uh, according to the scenario that we have laid out here. 2025 is the year he told us in advance through Jeremiah and Daniel. That's the 70th Jubilee. Uh, 2026 is the deception, mark of the beast. Uh, everyone falling for the Antichrist and thinking that he is the true Messiah. 
2027 is when the, I think, four armies or four nations from the east, sorry, from the west, are going to be coming to the east. Oh, sorry, they're from the east and they're going to the west. It's, uh, Israel is west of here, to, uh, east of here for me, but you get the idea. All right, and then in 2028, the eagles gather the bodies of the two witnesses. Uh, and then 2029, a mountain is thrown into the sea, which I believe is likely to be Apophis. And then 2030, the Son of Man comes and the nations mourn. And in 2031, the angels gather the elect uh, from the four corners of the earth. Everyone who's managed to survive, all the calamities and everything else are gathered and brought together to New Jerusalem. And these dates are confirmed by the 2,000 years to the cross. They're confirmed by the precise prophecy of Daniel telling us exactly when the abomination of desolation is going to be. And because we know when the abomination of desolation is going to be, we know the year counts to go back for the two witnesses. We know the 80th year of the fig tree generation. Uh, and we know all these other timings. It all fits like a puzzle piece perfectly together. Um, so I ask that you pray about this. You consider this. Uh, and if there's any other information, please comment. Please share this with your friends and family because time is running short. We don't have time to sit back and uh, you know, spend years trying to convert people. They've only got months. Uh, if, if my understanding of what the scripture and history is t teaching us, that is the time that we have. Thank you for watching and uh, please subscribe and I'll catch you next time.